Southeast Asia. Can you tell us thank for that, that, Amalia? And welcome back, everyone. Uh, before we get underway this morning, I just wanted to, to share, and many of you would have received my email, uh, and thank you to the, the PAC family for praying for Christine. Uh, Saturday morning, Christine, after her long struggle with uh, multiple myeloma, passed away, and it is such a, a sad loss for us, and yet we know that she is with her Lord and her Saviour in heaven. I uh, really want to encourage us to support each other, to pray for each other, and uh, the funeral is looking like it will be 11 a.m. on Wednesday morning. And so if you would like to, to, to connect and, and give thanks for Christine's life, I really encourage you to log in. Uh, Christine, as you know, is a, a wonderful, beautiful uh, servant of Jesus. Every week I would see her, uh, she would encourage me with how she had been, even in the midst of her cancer and her treatments, was sharing her faith uh, with people, the doctors, the patients, people on the trams. Uh, she was sharing her faith with everyone. Uh, and as she would say in her own words, now she has graduated. Now she has gone home. Now she is resting in the arms of her loving and almighty Heavenly Father. And we just want to give thanks for Christine. Uh, and we want to bless uh, her. And I, I would love to pray for us as we grieve and, and we mourn the loss of a, a beautiful sister in Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for Christine. We know that she came to us and our church family through an accident, and yet we know there are no accidents with you. God, that it was in your provision and your timing that you brought Christine into this place where, one, she would receive love and she would know family in a deeper way than ever before. Two, she would know the depths and the, the beauty of what it means to be loved and saved by your son, Jesus. And three, that she would encourage us in our faith. God, we thank you for her beautiful example. We thank you for her generous service among us, the many ways she has served even cleaning the church. God, and we thank you for her words and her wisdom that have so often spoken into our hearts. God, we thank you that in the midst of her struggles and her, her sickness, that you have continued to sustain her and strengthen her. We thank you for her faith in the midst of her trials. God, and we pray that we would continue to learn both from her example and from the many ways that she has touched our lives. God, we pray that we would be drawn into a deeper experience and understanding, a deeper sense of, of love and faith and hope because of her life among us. So we give thanks for her. God, and we pray now as we open your word, that you would open our hearts afresh. That we would see with new eyes, that we would hear in a new way. That we would respond truly with worship of you. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we get underway this morning, I wanted to say a huge thank you to our worship team. Uh, who have continued to lead us throughout this COVID time. Uh, the team here at church, as you see, Art had to pick up things very quickly and, and made the transition, uh, helping us bring church into your homes. Because as I was thinking about this, as I was thinking about today's message and, uh, and the word that we'll hear from our Premier later this afternoon about the next stage of lockdown and what it means for us individually and, and as a church family, it struck me that we have been now meeting for more, or it has been more than seven months since we gathered here at church. 39 weeks since we last worshipped here together as a church family. 217 days since we started doing church online. It's hard to believe, isn't it? 217 days. It's hard to believe how much our world, our community has changed in that time, how much we have changed, how much the church has changed. And while I have to admit I think we have adapted fairly well, I know there are things that we all miss. Some of you, I know you miss these hard wooden pews and falling asleep during the sermons on a Sunday morning, although you can still do that from home, I'm aware. 
Uh, for some of us, maybe we, we miss the opportunity to be able to meet in person. You know, as much as we get to see each other online and we can touch ourselves up via Zoom, nothing replaces the, the beauty and the connection of meeting together in person. The more I've thought about it, one of the things that I have to admit I really miss, one of the things I miss most is worshipping together. There's something beautiful and powerful about gathering together, about singing together, especially uh, for, for anyone who is musically challenged like myself. After a couple of weeks of being at home and doing church at home, I've realized how good it is to be at church surrounded by all these wonderful people who can hold a tune and who can drown out my joyful noise. But when it comes to worship, I've realized that so often as Christians we reduce it to music, to singing. And don't get me wrong, uh, worship is music. And we have been worshiping this morning with music and it has been wonderful. Thank you to the Esteres family. But it's important in this season, especially in this season when we cannot sing together and might not be able to do for some time, even if we can start to regather here at church, that we expand our understanding, our experience, our expression of worship. In fact, one of the, the key transitions that we have identified for ourselves as we journey through and indeed emerge from COVID is the need to recapture our passion and priority for Jesus to recapture the heart of worship because worship is bigger than music. Worship is about honoring and demonstrating the worth of something or someone. In today's passage, the focus of this worship is Jesus. So if you look at today's passage, John reveals that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. This one word, honour, describes the purpose of this meal. It describes the response of Mary and Martha and Lazarus in this passage, a desire to honour or to worship Jesus. And they do this, they each do this in three extremely different ways. So it's going on this text, this, in this meal, in this celebration between Jesus, his disciples and some of his closest friends, that is worship. Mary and Martha have been on this emotional roller coaster. They have just watched the younger brother die. And Jesus hadn't come to them, uh, not as they were hoping, not in time to save him. And yet Jesus comes to minister to them in their hour of need. When everyone else had lost hope. When they themselves were starting to question and doubt. Uh, Jesus comes. He sees their tears and he, he weeps with them and for them. And then he goes to the tomb and, and raises four days dead Lazarus from the tomb. And it's an amazing miracle. Jesus calls Lazarus from the tomb. They strip off his grave clothes. He's alive again. And it's such a, an amazing story. A demonstration of Jesus' power. And, and while these family already loved Jesus... It's in this moment that they see him for who he truly is. The resurrection and the life. And it changes them, it transforms them. And that's what the gospel does. The gospel transforms our hearts, it renews our lives, it gives a fresh vision of Jesus. That moves us to respond. How? In worship. To worship him in everything we do, with all that we have, no matter who we are with. That is how we are called to worship, in everything, with everything, with everyone we meet. If you've got your Bible handy, you can join me in John chapter 12 that was read for us by Amalia, where John sets the scene. Uh, after raising Lazarus from the dead, things have heated up. So uh, Jesus has withdrawn into the wilderness. He has withdrawn with his disciples for one final team retreat before he starts to make his way to Jerusalem in preparation for his death and resurrection. Shortly after, uh, Jesus arrives back in Bethany. He arrives at the house of Lazarus and his sisters in verse 2. Uh, John tells us, here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. 
You notice the first thing this family does in response to who Jesus is and what he has done? They host a meal, a dinner, a party for Jesus and his disciples and his friends. If one thing, there's uh, one thing the Jewish people love to do, it is throw a party. So I want you to imagine this party. There are people laughing and celebrating. There are people having fun with Lazarus, who has a, now a new lease on life, at the table entertaining the guests. In the background, the music is playing. The wine is flowing. And this endless supply of food keeps coming to the table. How? Because of Martha. Martha is quietly, diligently, graciously working behind the scenes to prepare the food, to to serve this meal, not under duress because this is her lot in life as a woman, but as her way of honouring Jesus. She worships Jesus in everything. She worships Jesus in everything she does. If you've grown up around the church, you'd know uh, Martha has generally had some bad press. We, we generally know Martha is a busy one, which is a negative thing. But there is something incredibly beautiful and powerful about what Martha does and the kind of hospitality she shows in this story. Uh, I saw this same heart and passion at work in our home on our 15th wedding anniversary on the 17th of September. Uh, Dinner had been delivered thanks to Jess's parents and the girls had taken things to another level. If you've been watching some of the the My Kitchen rules, uh, that was the sort of style we had at home. Kayla was the head chef uh, serving the meal in the kitchen. Evie was the head waitress and Zoe uh, was the entertainment at the table. Uh, I think that was maybe so she could get out of doing any work. Um, But they were so committed to their roles. We actually had to convince the two girls uh, to sit down. It was okay to leave their post in the kitchen and come and sit down and, and join us to eat our meal because they were committed. They were dedicated to serving. And that's what Martha is doing. With a thousand small actions, she is serving. She is worshipping Jesus. Every time she answers the door and welcomes someone in. Every time she cooks another dish and brings it to the table. Every time she fills a glass of wine or washes a dirty plate. Everything she does, every act of service, all of her work is an expression of worship. And I wonder if we ourselves need to recapture some of this heart. A number of years ago, I was introduced to uh, the writings of a a man named Brother Lawrence, a a lay priest in a Catholic monastery. Uh, Brother Lawrence was uh, known as being very clumsy. He tended to break everything he touched. So unsurprisingly, when he went to the war to fight, uh, he was injured. He returned home and, and settled to life in a monastery. And because he didn't have the education required to become a full cleric, He spent most of his years in the monastery washing dishes and repairing sandals. But in the midst of these menial activities, he discovered a pattern of worship that he articulated as practicing the presence of God. He said, the time of busyness does not for me differ from the time of prayer. In the noise and clatter of my kitchen, While several persons at the same time are calling for different things, I possess God in as great a tranquility as if I were on my knees in worship. It's not about vocation, but invocation. It's about inviting God into every job, every duty, every position, every act of service. As believers, we need to embrace the joy of following Jesus no matter where God has called us, no matter how great or insignificant the task he has given. As I read these words, I have to admit, it is so much easier said than done. In a world that is constantly vying for our attention and our affections, where people are pushing for this separation between the sacred and secular aspects of life, sometimes we have created this false dichotomy between our faith and our actions. And we need to recapture this pattern of worship, worshipping Jesus in everything we do. 
We need to recapture this pattern where our love and our desire to honour Jesus and serve him in everything we do. The way we go about our work, the patterns we have as we go about life at home, in every act of service that we undertake. Can you imagine if instead of, instead of begrudging obedience in the office, we chose to approach our work as a gift from God, an act of worship? Can you imagine instead of being, if, if instead of being asked to do things around the house, we thoughtfully took the initiative and did things anyway? Can you imagine if, if instead... Instead of waiting to be inv- asked to get involved in ministry through the church, we happily volunteered ourselves to serve. That's what Paul was talking about in Colossians when he says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. That's what it means to worship Jesus in everything we do. To serve humbly, to serve diligently. I wonder if you are joyfully choosing to serve and honour Jesus in everything you do. See, Martha worshipped Jesus. She worshipped Jesus with everything she did. And for the most part, people are okay with that. People are okay if you serve in ministry, if you practice hospitality, if you work... uh, to your heart's content. But it's his second act of worship that is a little more obvious and a little more extravagant and often causes some discomfort and even some conflict. Picture it, the table has been laid out. The guests have been seated at the table, which at the first century means they're reclining at the table on these futon-like mattresses. The meal has been prepared. For anyone who likes to eat laying on your back on the couch... Pizza in one hand, remote in the other. This is good news because it means uh, not only is it biblical, but it is not lazy. If Jesus ate like this, so can we, so can you. But admittedly, in this story, there is a little more to this than meets the eye. Part of the reason for lying back on these uh, futon-like mattresses was because the roads were dirt. Their feet were dirty, and so they wanted to keep their filthy, stinky, unclean feet as far away from the food as possible to stop them becoming unclean. And so somewhere amid all the festivities, the feet at the back of the room in the darkness, Mary quietly comes. She places herself at the feet of Jesus. And in this act of adoration and devotion, She worships Jesus with everything, with everything she has. Verse 3, then Mary took about a a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Now, maybe Mary was just over all these stinky feet. You know what it's like when you're in a house, an enclosed space, someone takes off their shoes, and that scent of smelly sneakers wafts through the room. But if that's the case, why does Mary go to Jesus? Maybe his feet were the smelliest. But it seems there is another intent. It seems she wants to honor Jesus, to show her devotion to Jesus. And so she goes to his feet the place that only slaves would sit. She dares to clean what only servants would touch. And out of all the things she could have used to wash his feet, she chooses this jar of nard, which, as Judas points out, is worth a whole year's worth of wages. And then instead of a towel... She unravels her hair, something Jewish women were prohibited from doing in public, and she wipes Jesus' feet. Mary humbles herself completely. She humiliates herself publicly. She offers herself and everything she has to honor and worship Jesus. It wasn't done publicly for others to see. My guess is no one even noticed Mary up until the point that the perfume 
uh, began to fill the house. And everyone turns to her. They look at her. Some with admiration. And yet others to criticize and condemn. And Judas uh, says, questions Mary's act of worship. He criticizes the expense and, and the extravagance. He condemns her under false pretenses. And yet what does Jesus do? He defends her. He commends her. And he challenges Judas's accusations. What Mary does here is profoundly beautiful. And yet it, it is incredibly unsettling. Because more than Mary's example, her actions serve as an invitation for us. An invitation for us to worship Jesus with all that we are and all that we have. Which means offering our bodies, our, our lives and our possessions to him. That's what Mary does in this act of unparalleled devotion. She not only pours out this expensive perfume, she empties herself. She uses her most expensive possession to honour Jesus, to worship him for who he is, to worship him in the way that he deserves. That's where the challenge comes for me and I think sometimes for us. See, far too often we worship. Our worship has become about us. It's become about our personal preferences. It has become about our agendas. It's become about keeping up appearances. Sure, we say the right things, we follow the religious patterns, but if our hearts were exposed like Judas in this story, I wonder if sometimes we'd find ourselves in opposition to Jesus, in judgment of others whose worship is far more generous or expressive than our own. But when we come to know Jesus like Mary, when we have seen his power, when we've experienced the, the life he offers, had our hearts transformed, that's when we are able to worship Jesus with all we have. It's when we're able to, to move beyond a, a worship that is safe and comfortable and, and doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't lead to criticism. To this place where we're able to humble even humiliate ourselves, to sacrifice ourselves, to honour Jesus. And that's when we start to worship him, not as we want, but as he deserves. For instead of worrying about the perceptions of others, we lay aside our lives and we lay everything we have at the feet of Jesus. Jesus. And I wonder if we are willing to do that. If we truly know Jesus to the depth of who he is and what he has done. If we would truly worship him and honour him with all that we are and all that we have. Reality is we often get focused in this story on uh, the dinner that Martha has put on. On Mary's extravagant act of worship and we tune out the rest of this story. And, and so as you come to the final scene, like Lazarus, I want us to see that we honour Jesus with our witness. We worship Jesus with everyone, for everyone we meet. So if you take a look at verse 9, uh, John tells us, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came. Not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. What's interesting about the way John writes this is it seems that, that Lazarus, uh, with his transformed heart, with a, a new lease on life, had been propelled into this perpetual state of witness. And this was the way he worked to honour Jesus. This was his pattern of worship. See, even though people were, were coming to see Jesus, John tells us that Lazarus has a purpose. 
The people wanted to meet Lazarus, to hear his story, to, to share in his testimony. And that's what Lazarus does. He uses his testimony to honor Jesus, to point people to Jesus, to tell them who Jesus is and show them what he has done. And his testimony was having such a profound impact. Verse 10 says, So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Now I know that's uh, the kind of image we often have when it comes uh, to sharing our faith, isn't it? We have this inherent fear that people are going to hate us, turn on us, tear us down, and it causes us often to hide our worship behind closed doors, to keep our faith to ourselves, to get on with life as though nothing has changed. And yet what we see from Lazarus is that when we have truly encountered Jesus, when we have experienced his power, when we have been transformed deep down in our hearts, one of the most normal, natural, and powerful things we can do to honor Jesus is share our story. Share our testimony with the people around us. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about going out on the, the streets, standing on the corners, and calling people to repent. Lazarus doesn't go out on the streets. See what he does? He stays close to Jesus. And he uses his home as a place of welcome and hospitality. And when people come looking, he is only too happy to introduce them to Jesus. To tell them what Jesus has done for him. And the new life that he has. You know what? I think all of us can do that. I think all of us have a story we can tell. A story about Jesus. And when we live from that place of service, our lives begin to reflect the love of Jesus. When we open our hearts to people who, and they can see the transformation that has taken place, it causes them to question. And that's when we have the opportunity, like Lazarus, to tell our story, to point people to Jesus. The question is not if we have a testimony. The question and the challenge is if we are willing to honor and worship Jesus in this way. If we are willing to worship Jesus with everyone we meet. And one of the things I find remarkable about this passage, this picture, this pattern of worship that emerges after the death and, and resurrection of Lazarus is it's just a foretaste, a, the foreshadowing, a, a reflection of a, a greater thing that Jesus has done, that he has done for us. See, when John sets a scene at the beginning here in verse 1, he tells us that six, this is six days before the Passover. And the question is, why does he do that? And I believe it is because he wants us to see that what has happened to Lazarus is actually pointing to us forward to an even greater act of God, to the death and resurrection of Jesus, what he would achieve for us. See, in just a week's time, we find Jesus, and he is hanging on a Roman cross. We find him taking on and dying the death that we deserved. We find him paying the price for my sin, your sin, the sins of the world, and yet in this same power that raised Lazarus from the dead, is at work in Jesus. In Jesus' resurrection, and it begins its work in us. The moment we place our faith in him. When we place our faith in Jesus, he gives us uh, forgiveness and freedom. He transforms our hearts and gives us a new lease on life. And the invitation we find here this morning is to consider our response. To consider your response to Jesus as you consider all that Jesus has done as you consider his life and, and death and resurrection what will your response be 
Are we truly honoring Jesus? Are we truly worshipping Jesus in everything we do, with all that we have, with everyone who crosses our path? To Christian worship, our worship as followers of Jesus, is about honoring Jesus, honoring uh, a Jesus in everything, with everything, for everyone to see. And if you are here this morning, and maybe you feel in yourself you've lost something of the heart of worship. If it's become all about the music. If you have this uh, divide between the sacred and the secular opening up in your lives, between what you sing on a Sunday and how you live the rest of your week. If you find your freedom in worship is limited by what you are comfortable with. If you find in your, yourself in a place where you uh, look and, and you judge others for what, the ways that they worship, that it's, it's too uh, full on, that it's extravagant. Even if you're afraid uh, to share your faith with those around you. The invitation here isn't to work harder. It isn't to sing louder. It isn't to try and manufacture something within ourselves. The invitation is to look at Jesus again, to look to Jesus and to consider everything he has done. To allow it to transform our hearts again. To take hold of the life that he gives and to invite, to allow his spirit to stir our hearts. So once again, we might worship Jesus. To worship him in everything we do. So we can honor him with everything we have. So we can share his story with everyone we meet. This is what it means to worship Jesus. To worship him in everything, with everything, before everyone we meet. And I wonder if you would be willing to let go of all those extra things. To stop worrying about the perceptions of others. To set your heart on Jesus. And worship him. To honor him. In everything, with everything, for everyone. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your unending love for us. That even though we were sinners, even though we had turned our backs, even though we had made a worship about other things and even ourselves, that you would send your son, Jesus. That you would give him to die on a cross. That you would raise him to life. So that we might be forgiven so that we might experience freedom, that we might have our hearts transformed and our lives renewed in him. Lord God, we admit that we have made worship about us. We have made worship about church. God, we ask that you would truly expand our hearts and our vision that we might see worship is about honoring you. Honoring you in everything we do, with everything, our lives and all that we have, so that everyone might see and come to worship Jesus. God, we pray that you would continue to stir our hearts, that we might truly know the beauty of and the joy of knowing you. We might truly embrace the life and the love that you have shown us in Jesus. And we might live a life of worship. 
in every day with all we have, no matter who we're with. And we pray that we would do this for the good of all people and we pray that we would do this for your glory. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to, to begin that journey with us, to worship together with our last song.